record or maybe this meeting is being recorded i i think you're okay so maria is also doing it so i'm not gonna um yeah i think now people are just jumping in so maybe we should wait another minute <laughs> but okay it, let's just move forward um yeah so i am um honored to introduce bratislav message a mathematician with expertise in neuroimaging and network science um, yeah, Bratislav received his PhD from the University of Toronto in 2012, where he was supervised by Randy McIntosh. Then he became a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Indiana with Olaf Sporns. Um, since 2016, he leads the Network Neuroscience Lab at the Montreal um, Neurological Institute, McGill University, where he is a tenured associate professor holding a prestigious Canada Research Chair. Um, his group studies how interactions among brain areas support cognitive function, complex behavior, and global network dynamics. Bratislav was awarded numerous prizes, for instance, a Brain Canada Future Leader and the Quebec Bioimaging Network's Rising Star Award in 21, and the New Investigator Award from the Can Canadian Association for Neuroscience this year. Um, additionally, he's an advocate of open science, and his lab has provided many open source toolboxes, including Neuromaps, a toolbox for transforming uh, brain air, brain maps, a Bajan, if I'm pronouncing it right, a toolbox for processing imaging um, transcriptomics dataset, and the one I use almost daily that that is your um, labs, um, I think Python library, Net Neuro Tools with uh, many nifty functions for network neuroscience. Um, Bratislav is um, very well known for his work on brain network communication, which is also the theme of this research center. Um, his presentation today, as you can see, yeah, towards annotated brain networks. Um, and we are much looking forward to the presentation. Yeah, I think uh -huh. the stage is yours. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much, Kaysen, and thank, and thank you, Klaus, as well, uh, for the opportunity to speak here. Thank you, all of you, for coming uh, so late in the afternoon on what appears to be the, the, the nicest and warmest day of the year so far. Uh, so hopefully I won't keep you long. Um, uh, so I'll talk a little bit about this idea that's um, that's been on our minds for the past um, five, six years or so. Um, the idea that maybe we should be taking the network models that we have of the brain and we should be annotating them with biological information. I think it's an idea that in many ways um, has existed long before um, I, I, I came around. Um, and certainly in Hamburg, um, a, a lot of inspirational uh, work has, has come out uh, from Klaus's group on this topic as well. Um, so I just want to start by uh, showing you this picture. This is uh, how I've kind of uh, grown up uh, thinking about the brain. Um, as a, a network or a graph of gray matter nodes that's interconnected by a set of white matter edges. Um, and uh, this way of looking at the brain has been extremely influential. It's been very useful in the sense that it allows us to focus on the connection patterns and to try to understand um, the architectural features that support uh, different aspects of perception, cognition, and action, and so on. Uh, but it's an inherently abstracted view of the brain. It's a, it's a, a way it's actually in a way a kind of a dimensionality reduction step um, because we tend to when we uh, look at anything to do with uh, brain connectivity uh, we tend to pretend that all the nodes are the same um, but we know that all of these neural populations are not the same we know that they're they can be different in many different ways uh, from the more molecular features such as gene expression the arrangement of neurotransmitter receptors to metabolism um, the proportions of different cell types, um, laminar differentiation, um, intrinsic electrophysiological uh, um, uh, dynamics, and so on. And it's not as though this type of information is completely uh, inaccessible to us. There are numerous techniques, and with the advent of kind of open data sharing, now uh, data sets out there that allow us uh, to get at many of these features. Um, many of these you can get with garden variety MR scans. You can get them with more advanced protocols. And like I said, you can get them also from, from other resources um, that, that are available to you. Um, and 
as we started to, to think about how we can bring different sources of um, information about multi-scale brain organization into our network models, uh, we often would look at adjacent fields. And one of the, the, the kind of fields that we always um, look at uh, from brain imaging, at least we find very useful, is bioinformatics. And so uh, with brain imaging, what we're doing is we're constantly generating reference maps about the brain, where are different cell types located, uh, where are different neurotransmitter receptors located, things like this. But these maps will often come in very difficult to compare coordinate systems. Um, as anyone who's ever tried to do this will know, uh, many of the maps that you see in, in cool new papers, they're often shared ad hoc. You have to email someone in another lab who knows somebody else in another lab in order to get that um, map of, I don't know, the um, uh, glycolysis or something like this. Um, and many, many times as they'll talk uh, as well, uh, when you compare brain maps, you're not really taking into account uh, spatial autocorrelation and uh, the methods have been so far very permissive. So if you were to have a new map, um, you have some task activation map, in fMRI or you have a case control difference in cortical thickness or something, how do you cross-reference it with other canonical maps? Ideally, that's actually what you want, right? Like you, you go through your workflow and you, you generate a new map and you wanna know, does this map of disease or, or of a particular type, does it co-localize to something else that can then inform my future experiments? Does the, my disease map co-localize with a particular cell type? Does my a particular task activation map co-localized with a particular receptor. And uh, in adjacent fields like genomics, uh, this is actually a, a very common workflow. So these new maps are routinely compared uh, to establish reference maps for very complete structural and functional profiling. I'm showing G profiler here on the right, but there actually exist numerous such libraries in genomics and, 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 and metabolomics as well. Uh, where these are living data sets that are continually updated so that when you have a new, when you generated a new read or something like this, you can easily go and, and compare it to what's already there. So we try to do something a little bit like that uh, with a tool that uh, we've called Neuromaps. And it's really just a, a play on the, on the word Google Maps, kind of like a Google Maps for the brain. And the idea, and so I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about uh, some of the work that we've been doing in this domain from the perspective of neuromaps, although that's not necessarily uh, kind of the, 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 main, the main point. Uh, but uh, it's a Python toolbox. And the idea is you can come in with any kind of brain map that you like. Um, the toolbox then has kind of three components that you can use independently of each other, or you can use in a single workflow. But one component is that we provide you with a set of transformations to go above, um, among the different um, neuroimaging spaces. We provide a library of uh, different reference maps about brain structure and function. And then we provide a suite of um, spatial null models for comparing brain maps. And then you can use this to get an enrichment score for your map, whether your map is enriched in, in, in different biological features. Uh, so I'll take you through each of these uh, in step and, and use this, like I said, as a vehicle to talk a little bit more generally about this problem of annotated brain, brain networks. Um, so the library is kind of the most fun part in a way, because uh, what we've done is we've kind of, in, an, in a very artisanal way, we've curated a library of uh, original space uh, reference maps to do with different things about the brain. So we have um, this very broad category that we call microstructure. So this has both um, information from MR, uh, but then also from diff other different techniques, including, uh, for instance, from PET, we have this beautiful map of synapse density from the UCBJ tracer. Uh, we have different measures of metabolism uh, from different, pers different perspectives, again, both BOLD and uh, PET. Uh, we have different measures of cortical expansion. So these are uh, areas of the brain that undergo the greatest expansion, either during um, evolution or during development. We've also got information both from uh, sources of the MEG and from intracranial EEG for the different canonical electrophysiological frequency bands and their, the, the spatial distribution of those power maps. So delta, theta, alpha, and so on, um, as well as the, the kind of the intrinsic time scale map that everyone likes to look at and so on. Uh, we also have information from cross-referencing with the big brain histological atlas. We have the thicknesses of the different uh, of the six different canonical layers across the brain. 
And uh, using information from the Allen Human Brain Atlas and cell type deconvolution, we've derived a set of maps for different types of uh, cells as well. Um, the thing that I want to stress here is that all of these maps are in their original native space. Um, so when you, and as a result, we've also provided a set of transformations that will allow you um, to, to compare your desired map to these maps in the space that you prefer. Um, so now the, the kind of the, the biggest part of neuromaps, or at least the library, the one that we actually had to do a little bit more legwork for, are the maps of a neurotransmitter receptor. So what we, uh, as many of you know, um, it's, it's very possible, uh, and it has been for a very long time, to uh, map the distribution of different neurotransmitter receptors on the brain using uh, techniques such as a positron emission tomography or PET. Um, the problem with PET is that it is sort of sort of invasive in the sense that you're injecting someone with a radioactive tracer. Uh, it's very expensive. So uh, basically the sample sizes are low. And for whatever reason, the different groups weren't necessarily uh, talking to one another um, and, and sharing data with each other. Oftentimes the, the point of these studies was to really look at uh, what happens in patients with a particular condition. But we were more interested in um, using this technology to ask what is the normative distribution of receptors uh, in the human brain. So what we did uh, around this, maybe 2019, 2020, we started cold calling everyone that we knew who had data. So we would call up uh, people first in Montreal, and then uh, we broaden our horizons to the rest of the world, um, asking people to share their pet data with us. And uh, kind of long story short, at the end of all of this, we had compiled a whole bunch of data sets that spanned um, about 19 different neurotransmitters, receptors, and transporters across nine different neurotransmitter systems. Um, so that you can see the maps right there. And, um, and, and this is also, again, part of neuromaps um, ready to use. Obviously, uh, receptors are of particular interest for many of us because it's, uh, it's probably the most um, actionable feature that you can get for the brain in the sense that you can uh, design uh, drugs to, to, um, to manipulate um, uh, this particular system. Uh, I'm also showing you at the bottom just how easy it would be to actually uh, do some of this work in neuromaps. It's usually just one line of code, uh, sometimes two, um, but uh, this is just to give you an idea of, of how this would work. Um, okay, uh, we also have a contribution pipeline, I should mention that. Uh, the contribution pipeline there, uh, there's about a group of about four or five of us who are constantly monitoring support tickets and everything for Neuromaps. So if you have a map that you think should be included, uh, please do let us know and we'll try our hardest to, uh, to, to uh, upload it. I'll also just uh, point out one thing. Um, if you did want to, uh, I mentioned that uh, we do have some data from, uh, from gene expression. Um, you, this whole tool of Neuromaps actually interfaces with another tool that we made called Abigen. Uh, which is a, uh, specifically a tool that allows you to download and pre-process the uh, gene transcription data from the Allen Human Brain Atlas. It actually works with the Allen Mouse Atlas as well. Um, it all it does the whole thing in an, in just under a minute usually, um, and uh, it actually has all of the different uh, steps implemented for you that you would need to do to actually pre-process this data and work with it. Um, it'll and it, it gives you a lot of options. So you can either work with specific regions of interest that you've masked out. You can work with um, different atlases. You can work with the individual donors or get a group average. You can do, um, um, we have a very nice tool for interpolating uh, this data and so on. Um, and it's not, it's not gonna uh, cook your dinner for you, but it will write your method section for you. So depending on the steps that you choose to, um, uh, the, the particular options that you choose in your pre-processing pipeline, it'll actually write out a nice standardized um, method section that'll then allow you to actually compare, or allow all of us to compare what each of us is doing. And if we ever have any disagreement, uh, we can at least try to suss out where that came from. So it's just our like um, very small attempt to standardize the workflows in this domain. But anyway, the point is that uh, you can actually get information in neuromaps also for individual genes. Um, okay, so that's the library. Um, now you have the library, you have all the maps in their native space. How do you actually go about uh, transforming spaces to one another? So again, anyone who's actually tried to do this will know what a pain in the ass this can be sometimes. 
uh, where you know the ma one map that you get is in MNI 152, another map is in some surface space. What do you do? So um, we provide support for uh, basically the, the kind of the major neuroimaging spaces, MNI 152, CIVET, FS average, and FSLR, also in, in different um, in different resolutions. Uh, so if you want to go surface to uh, volume to surface, we've implemented registration fusion. And if you want to go between the different surfaces, we've implemented multimodal surface matching. So we did not invent these techniques. Um, these are the, the original papers here, but we did do extensive testing to try to see what would be the best technique to do this. And at least in our hands, you can see this in the paper as well. Um, these two techniques really are as good as advertised. And, and now you have um, a method to either take your target map and transform it into the, the same space as the, as the source map that you want to compare it to or uh, vice versa. Um, we also provide uh, methods for parcellation. So just uh, um, input any kind of um, atlas and uh, we, we can do that too. Okay, uh, last but not least, um, the spatial nulls. So anytime you want to compare two brain maps, um, really what are, yeah, yeah, anytime you want to compare two brain maps, really what you're doing most of the time is, um, is a spatial correlation. Um, so uh, I'll just give you an example, and I've picked an example from our own work, just so that I don't kind of make fun of other people. Uh, but this is a, a, a paper that we did a few years ago, a really cool idea, actually. We were looking, we had developed a way to look at how the structural connectivity profile of a brain area is related to the functional connectivity profile of that same area. So we were looking at structure function relationships but we were doing this per brain region. And what this is showing you is how well structure and function fit together in different brain areas. And we've chosen this particular way of showing you things to emphasize areas where you have actually uh, lower structure function coupling. So those are the bigger, um, the, the bigger circles here. And you can see that this actually looks very much like that famous unimodal transmodal gradient or the natural axis. Um, and, and, and this is, this is that, that particular uh, gradient um, shown, derived exactly the same way um, as uh, Daniel Margulis had proposed, uh, going unimodal to tresmodal. And what we had done was we said, well, it looks like areas where you have poorer structure function coupling, kind of greater untethering of structure function, um, of structure and functional connectivity, those appear to be the transmodal areas. And indeed that's so, you can see that there's a nice negative correlation between the two. Okay, so um, the problem is this. Basically, when we first did this um, and we submitted the paper, we got these hilariously uh, overinflated p-values, basically 10 to the minus 60. And uh, one reviewer said kind of, well, that's a cute story, but everything that you're doing is wrong. Um, and the reason that everything, it, everything is wrong is that when you do a scatter plot like this, and you do a correlation like this, where you're you know you're taking one brain map and correlating it with another. Um, the points here are all brain areas. Um, they all come from a spatially embedded system that's spatially contiguous, and so brain areas are not independent of one another. Areas that are close together are going to be just more similar to each other side architectonically, just naturally, and also. In most of the imaging techniques that we use, we have some degree of spatial smoothing. So these points in the scatter plot are not independent. They therefore violate a very basic assumption in Aaron, both in the parametric test that you would use here, but then also if you were to do just a naive permutation test. And um, anytime you uh, correlate spatially autocorrelated brain maps, you're going to get these inflated p values. And I'm just going to demonstrate the nature of the problem here. So what I'm doing here is I'm generating um, two uh, completely random brain maps and that are designed to be uncorrelated, actually. And I am adding um, some degree of spatial smoothing to both maps. And you can see it as I start to increase spatial smoothing, I go from two brain maps that have zero correlation to two brain maps that are highly anti-correlated with one another. Um, so anytime you have greater spatial autocorrelation, you're going to have fewer true degrees of freedom. And as a result, you're going to have spurious correlations. So 
if we are going to have any kind of framework for comparing brain maps to one another, like what we would like to have in our maps, we need to have ways of controlling for this effect. And at the time that we were doing this, um, there were two kind of families of methods that, emer that had emerged. One are the so-called spin tests developed by Aaron Alexander Block. So what's happening here is you would take a brain map, a map of annotations, and you can project it to a sphere. You can then uh, apply random angular rotations to that sphere and then bring that map back to the surface. And this allows you to generate a new brain map that has the exact same distribution of annotations, uh, the exact same values, but their positions on the, um, on the surface have been randomly permuted while preserving their spatial autocorrelation. So that's one kind of way of generating a population of null uh, maps. The other uh, family uh, of nulls that exist, but this is probably the best example, is um, are the so-called parameterized nulls, where you try to estimate some feature of the original brain map, and then you randomly generate uh, new maps that retain those features. So this is an example from the Brain Smash toolbox from uh, Josh Burt and John Murray who estimate the variogram in, the, in, in, a, in a desired brain map, and then they generate um, new, new brain maps with, uh, that approximately match the variogram. Um, so uh, by the way, if you're interested in, in, in kind of null models more generally, uh, Frantishek Vasha and I recently wrote a review of null models in network neuroscience. So it, it concerns both these spatial nulls, but also all sorts of rewired nulls, um, uh, surrogate time series, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, I encourage you to take a look at that if you want. But um, the reason I wanted to show you this is that at, at the time that we were trying to implement this, there had been at least 10 different methods that have been proposed in the literature, including various versions of these spin tests and different types of uh, parameters generated models. And I just want to show you this. So um, this is a simple um, brain map with a gradient that goes kind of sagittally. Um, there are different ways of implementing this Alexander, Eleanor, Aaron Alexander Block um, spin test method, depending on uh, when you're dealing with parcellated data, depending on uh, what you want to happen when a medial wall gets rotated into a, a brain parcel. And then there are also different parameterized data models as well. Um, so we wanted to know how well do the methods compare and how, specifically how well do they control uh, family-wise error. So this is what we did. Um, we would take a brain map that I'm calling X and another brain map that we're calling Y, um, and we would correlate them. So you get a, a correlation between them. You would then take one of these methods that I showed you just now and apply um, a, the, the spin or the whatever um, to generate a thousand null instances of one of these maps, in this case, uh, map Y. You would then take the original X correlated with each of the null Y maps and get a distribution of correlation coefficients. And then you would count the number of correlations that are more extreme than the original empirical correlation. You would then normalize this. If you ran this a thousand times, you would normalize this by a thousand to get a, a p-value. And then the number of p-values that are less than 0.05, that's your family-wise error. So this is what we did. We uh, wanted to know, first of all, how the methods compared, but then also we wanted to know to what extent were they dependent on spatial autocorrelation and on the parcellation and the resolution of the data. So what we're doing here is we're um, generating brain maps uh, by uh, placing Gaussian random fields on a grid, and we're projecting them to, to a surface, actually to the FS average surface. And this little parameter alpha that you're going to see for the rest of this slide it's a parameter that allows us to, to tune the extent of spatial autocorrelation in our data. So you can see that as we increase spatial autocorrelation, the math looks smoother and smoother. That's good. This would be an example simulation where we have two brain maps with a desired correlation of 0.15. Um, and then first of all, just a sanity check. Um, here we're um, looking at the distribution. If we do this many, many, many times with random maps and we start increasing spatial autocorrelation, what happens to the correlation coefficients between pairs of maps? So you can see that as you start to increase the spatial autocorrelation going from alpha zero to alpha three, you start to get these wider and wider distributions, meaning that very frequently you get uh, brain maps that are highly correlated or anti-correlated with one another, but obviously this is spurious. 
So it works exactly as it should. And then now we start comparing the different methods which we implemented. Um, so what you're seeing here is the false positive rate on the y-axis, and you're seeing the extent of spatial autocorrelation on the x-axis. Um, the kind of desired um, rate of 0.05 is shown here in the dashed line. What you can see is that, first of all, um, almost immediately, the spatially naive methods, so the ones where you just kind of um, do a naive permutation or um, you use the, the, the standard kind of um, student's t uh, to get the, the p-value, um, those immediately kind of just shoot off into space. Almost immediately, you start to get nearly 100% uh, false positives. Um, the other methods uh, tend to do pretty well uh, up to a point, but at very high levels of spatial autocorrelation, even these methods can't appropriately deal with the false positives. Um, this is true both for the dense FS average surface, but then also for both um, various um, structural and functional atlases. This Kamun atlas, for those who don't know, this is kind of a, a multi-resolution um, subdivision of the Desik and Kiliani atlas that is very popular in the field. And uh, the last thing that I want to point out is that generally the uh, spatial permutation tests, so different implementations of the spin test, tend to be a little bit more conservative than the various parameterized nulls. Um, but as I said, neither class of methods can completely control the false positive rate at very high levels of spatial autocorrelation. Um, so the, the thing that I want to get across here is that naive nulls are completely inappropriate for significance testing when you're comparing pairs of brain maps. Um, the choice of particular null um, will depend on the context on your research problem. So we do find that these spatial um, permutation nulls tend to be the most statistically accurate, but you can really only use them when you have cortical surfaces. Um, so anytime you um, have volumes and you can't go to, to the surface, anytime you have um, subcortex, cerebellum, anything like that, you're going to want to use uh, one of these parameterized nulls uh, preferably the, the BIRD 2020 Brain Smash toolbox. Um, and, but the good news is that the spatial nulls really are mostly parcellation and resolution invariant. Uh, we, so you don't necessarily need to pick the null that, you know, that specifically fits um, your atlas. Um, so that's a very roundabout way of uh, just telling you a little bit about this topic of uh, spatial null models, which I think is very important, but also just to say that all of these methods are implemented in the Neuromaps toolbox, and they're they're ready to use it again. It's very simple to implement them, as you can see here from uh, from this example snippet of code. Okay, so that's the the entire toolbox. Um, I just want to show you how this might work in practice. What you might want to do with something like this. So this is an example from a recent paper where we took data from the Enigma consortium. So um, this is a consortium that collects. Um, data on various diseases. In this case, this, uh, these are 13 psychiatric, neurological, and neurodevelopmental disorders. So they're maps of cortical thinning. They basically just compare um, T1s between uh, patients and controls. And um, so you're, what you're seeing here are for the different um, diseases and disorders, you're getting their, the changes in cortical thickness relative to controls. And then we use neuromaps to ask, do these patterns of cortical thinning co-localized with any particular neurotransmitter rece receptor or transporter. And um, so what you're seeing here in, the, in each row is a particular disease. Um, your, the R squared that's shown here is how well can we predict the spatial distribution of cortical thinning based on different neurotransmitter receptors. And then the rest of this uh, kind of table here is showing you the uh, the, 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 ex the, the particular combinations of uh, receptors that correspond, that best help you to predict the spatial distribution of this disease. So um, this is nice in the sense that we can actually do very well for most diseases, except for a couple which we never thought we would, uh, such as just uh, generalized epilepsy and schizotypy. Um, we get many kind of quote unquote textbook hits that we might expect, such as the serotonin transporter being involved in a lot of psychiatric diseases. Uh, but then oftentimes we would get interesting hits that um, you wouldn't necessarily consider to be textbook um, associations, but 
if you look at the literature, you'll often see examples of this um, in, 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 in different papers. So one example here is the histamine receptor being associated with Parkinson's disease. Um, there is a, actually kind of a, a fairly large animal literature on this. Again, it, although it's not necessarily something that um, the, the first type of uh, neurotransmitter system that we associated with Parkinson's, obviously. Okay, um, so that's NeuroMaps. Uh, it's very easy to install and run. We, we are monitoring it uh, for issues and things like this. And I think we're pretty quick to uh, address problems. Uh, so please do use it and let us know how we can make it better. Um, and then just uh, in the last kind of uh, 15 minutes or so, I wanna talk a little bit about um, now that we have a, a method to pull in all the different maps of brain structure and function and different kind of levels of organization, how can we do this to enrich our connectome models and what can we do with this kind of data? So uh, this would be an example of, you know, you bring in a map from an annotation, you get your uh, network and once you've um, uh, zoomed in and looked at, you know, which nodes correspond to which locations of the map, you can essentially color the nodes and you have an annotated brain network. Um, this is one example where we looked at the notion of assortative mixing. So assortativity is basically the tendency for two nodes to connect if they are similar to each other in some way. That's the definition. Now, in connectomics, if you look at the literature, assortativity has really only been used with uh, one particular network feature, and that is degree. So degree assortativity is this idea of uh, are two brain hubs more likely to be connected with one another? Um, if are two nodes with, uh, with lots of connections likely to be connected and are two nodes with very few connections likely to be connected? Uh, but really, it's a very general concept and you don't necessarily need to look at degrees. You can look at really any biological annotation. And um, this is how you would do it. Basically, you have uh, node I and node J. You have uh, you know, their you know, metabolic score or uh, thickness for, in layer four or something like this. And you basically correlate the two. Um, so that's what uh, we did here. We actually pulled together uh, connectome data from uh, both you know, human structural and functional data, macaque, mouse, and so on. And then we looked at a wide variety of uh, biological attributes and annotations in these different systems. And um, uh, you can take a look at the paper if you're more interested. I'll show you one highlight. Um, and uh, this, this is a little bit um, hard to read, but basically what's happening here is that you're looking at the different um, organisms. And on the x-axis, what we're doing is we're gradually removing uh, connections of different lengths. So on the left here, you have completely intact connectomes, and then we're removing progressively longer and longer and longer connections. So on the right-hand side, what you have is basically a pruned down version of the connectome where you only have long distance connections. And on the y-axis, you're seeing the assertivity of these networks with respect to different biological annotations. So what you're seeing is that basically, um, you go from occasionally assortative, although sometimes not even significantly assortative networks, to very disassortative networks, meaning that when you have only long distance connections, areas are much more likely to be connected if they have very different annotations to one another. So this is really cool because there is, there's always been this mystery of what the long distance connections in the brain might actually be useful for. Um, and what this is showing you is that they uh, serve to actually connect neural populations that have different microarchitecture, and therefore they help to potentially diversify the inputs that you're exposed to. Um, we, you can now, you can actually go and look at more uh, sophisticated graph theoretic measures as well from the perspective of annotation. So this is um, um, kind of a, a pet topic that we really love called path motifs. Um, so here what we, we're doing is we're taking the structural connectivity network and we're computing shortest paths on it. So shortest paths are basically the sequence of edges, the shortest contiguous sequence of edges that it takes to go from one node to another. Now, if you, if you read the lit literature uh, and you look at the statistics that people are using, most of the time they're actually um, using summary statistics 
of this um, kind of shortest path idea. So uh, people who are doing characteristic path length, that's obviously part of the small world list definition. People who are doing things like between the centrality, um, closeness centrality, things like this. These are all measures that tell you, you know, on average, what is the proportion of shortest paths that go through a particular node? What is the average shortest path in the network and so on? People very rarely actually look at what sequence of brain areas is encountered along a path. So these are presumably important communication pathways. And as a signal travels from a source node to a target node, it's going through a series of neuronal populations that are presumably somehow transforming the nature of the signal. And as you're going through different types of circuit configurations along the way, presumably the nature of that signal changes. So we wanted to know whether we could retrace, actually trace out the specific uh, paths in a network and uh, annotate them with a particular feature. So in this case, what we did just as a proof of concept, we took uh, functional connectivity in the same participants. We again uh, derived this unimodal, transmodal, or natural axis, and we labeled uh, the nodes along a particular communication pathway according to where they sit in this putative unimodal transmodal hierarchy. And what that allows you then to do is uh, trace out a series of these so-called path motifs where you can um, ask whether paths are going up the hierarchy, down the hierarchy, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I'm not going to show you any more than this, but just to say that uh, what we did find was that actually the vast majority of communication pathways in the brain appear to travel in this very canonical, either top down or bottom up kind of trajectory. And the very, very small pro proportion that ever change their um, direction along the way, something like what you might be seeing here, um, all do so in the attention related areas and networks. So this shows you that um, at least the anatomical connectivity of attention networks um, supports kind of rapid transitioning between bottom up and top down uh, processing, or at least provide the, the infrastructure for something like that. Um, okay, so uh, another uh, thing that we very much uh, like to look at is structure function coupling. I showed you a little bit uh, about these efforts to look at uh, the extent to which we can predict functional connectivity from structural connectivity in different parts of the brain. That's that same figure right here. So this is showing you that in Unimodal cortex, there is a good concordance between structural and functional connectivity. And in transmodal cortex, there is poor concordance between structural and functional connectivity. Now, obviously, the one of the most important biological annotations is going to determine the extent to which you have um, structure function coupling is the distribution of neurotransmitter receptors because they modulate firing rates and so on. Um, so what we asked was, well, if the distribution of neurotransmitter receptors is that important, would it actually help us to improve the prediction of function from structure? So what you're seeing here is, like I said, the map of predicting function from structure. So just from structural connectivity. This is predicting functional connectivity from both structure and from the distribution of neurotransmitter receptors. And what you're seeing here is that basically for most areas, we get this quite, quite, a, quite a significant boost in predictive power. Um, in other words, uh, you know, adding uh, information about microarchitecture and adding annotations to our network models can help to um, make our models more vertical and also more um, just, just better overall. Uh, the last a kind of line of work that I'll show you to, to kind of just cement this idea that uh, annotations are very important is in the domain of disease modeling. Um, so uh, we and others have uh, been looking uh, a lot at the domain of neurodegenerative diseases. Uh, and here there's been a consensus over the last 10 or 15 years as to how or what the mechanism is, the, the molecular mechanism. Basically in Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's, FTD, ALS, and so on, what happens is that um, normal proteins, uh, for whatever reason, misfold. And when they become misfolded, they uh, can, uh, when they come into contact with other normal proteins, they can cause those proteins to misfold. And when enough of these uh, misfolded proteins accumulate in a cell, that cell dies and you get atrophy. Now, the, the key discovery has been that these proteins 
don't just diffuse spatially, isotropically, rather they diffuse transsynaptically. So they only seem to travel via axons and go from cell to cell via synapses. Uh, what this means is that we can take uh, brain networks and we can model the spread of these uh, misfolded proteins like an epidemic that takes place on these brain networks. And we can use these computational models to try to predict the spatial patterning of uh, atrophy in, in, in silico. And then we can compare this to actual patterns of atrophy that we get in, um, in, in different patient uh, populations. So in each of these diseases, the actual protein is different um, and the starting point is different, but the mechanism is the same. And so what I'm showing you here is uh, work that we did uh, trying to predict the spread of misfolded proteins in Parkinson's disease. So this is the, the, here the protein is called alpha synuclein and where the annotation comes, the annotations come in is this. Um, what you're seeing here on, in blue is how well we can predict the spatial patterning of atrophy uh, when um, we assume that all brain areas are synthesizing and clearing these misfolded proteins at the same rate. But we actually know the protein that codes for, the, uh, the sorry, the gene that codes for this particular protein. Uh, it's called SNCA, codes for, codes for synuclein. And we also know the gene that codes for the enzyme that clears alpha synuclein, something called GBA. And so what we did was we simply took uh, re the expression values of these two uh, genes from the Allen Human Brain Atlas. And we said, uh, we're going to run a simulation where the synthesis is proportional, the regional differences in synthesis are going to be proportional to the expression of SNCA. And regional differences in clearance are going to be proportional to the expression of GBA. And when you do that, you see that you can actually boost, that's what's shown in red here, you can, again, boost the uh, predictive power of both of these models, um, despite the fact that we're not adding any new parameters to the data. And um, you can play this game uh, in much more detail. This is just an example from, uh, we, we, we did something similar in frontotemporal dementia, but here we actually could pick the specific um, genes that correspond to the ge different ge genetic variants of the disease, and we can, and we can make these sort of almost tailored to different subpopulations of patients. Again, we can uh, predict um, the, the spatial distribution of these uh, uh, of this disease much better if we include information about, um, about um, local annotations. Um, and then kind of bringing this whole thing uh, together, um, obviously we are, we like the, the idea that local molecular annotations are important for predicting the spatial um, distribution of a disease. We also, because we're primarily a connectomics lab, we we'll like the idea that something about network architecture is going to help you to predict which areas are going to be most uh, vulnerable to a particular disease. So what we did is uh, we kind of did a, a massive death match of um, different local uh, molecular predictors and different connectomic predictors in these different diseases. So again, we went back to Enigma and we looked at the spatial patterning of different diseases. And we asked um, how well do, uh, let me just make sure I get this right. So uh, in yellow, you're seeing how well can I use local molecular predictors to predict uh, a particular disease? And in blue, how well do, do the connectomic predictors do? And you can see actually across the board, these molecular predictors tend to do better than the connectomic predictors. Um, later on in the paper, we show that actually they tend to account for different portions of variance. So you can actually even put them together um, to, to do much better. The cool thing here is not only are the local molecular predictors really good, but actually the, the single best predictor is this uh, receptor gradient um, that, uh, that we have here that we derived from the receptor data set that I told you about earlier. Um, okay, so I don't really have any concluding slide except to say that I really hope I've convinced you that um, we, ha we have the, the means, we have access to data from a variety of sources that will help us to make our network models more biologically plausible, more veridical, and that can really, by including information about annotations, uh, we can make our inferences stronger, more interesting, and, and set up uh, future work in, in a much better way. 
Um, so thank you very much for your attention and I'm really happy to take questions.